Can a boom in Great Lakes human populations affect fish as much as aquatic invasive species? What is a black carp and why should we care? And what is in a name when it comes to invasive species? To find out, let's ask Dr. Fish. That's right. It is uh, Ask Dr. Fish, episode 6, June 19th, 2023. My name is Stuart Carlton, and I work with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, but I am not a Dr. Fish, uh, but I'm fortunate today to be joined by multiple doctors. Fish. First, we have Katie O'Reilly, Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Katie, how's the fish fishing? The fish are, the fish are fishing. It is a beautiful day fishing. here in central Illinois. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we have a second. Do- one Dr. Fish is good. Two Dr. Fish are gooder. Uh, so we have Titus Seilheimer joining us from a boat. From He's a on boat. a boat. It's Titus. Titus, where are you? I am on the uh, lovely uh, waters of Lower Green Bay in Lake Michigan. The waters of Lower Green Bay. Amazing. Look at that. Last but not least, this is not a Dr. Fish and not as exciting because she's not on a boat, but it's Carolyn Foley. Carolyn, my friend, I guess you should have come earlier. We should have had the big finish with Titus there. Um, no, I'm happy to follow a boat because we can just watch where Titus is the entire time. So, all right. Yeah. Oh. Titus might be coming and in Titus, and out. Uh, <laughs> is... Yeah, we'll that, do the best we that can. might be all we get of Titus. <laughs> That's all right. Really, go in quick with those questions. Yeah, If you are listening live, uh, we are streaming live to Facebook, YouTube, um, everywhere, right? Uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the little comment box. If you're on Twitter, use the hashtag AskDrFish. Um, we type in your, uh, we'll take your questions as soon as possible. And uh, we are recording this as a reminder for a podcast. So sometimes we may have to do some podcast stuff, right? And go back and repeat something to make sure we have beautiful, clean audio for the listening audience. Uh, but then we'll with that, video. Stuart, I'm, a, I'm on a boat, Stuart. Yeah. Your audio <laughs> is going to be a mess. <laughs> that is true uh, i'm trying to eventually bring everybody down to my level of competence some we have to handicap by putting them on a boat but that's neither here nor here but all the, right during the, the last video is amazing though today all right video get to primo. The questions. primo video let's get to the questions topic one more anglers fewer fish during the last ask dr fish live for my angler uh carolyn really wanted to talk about urban fishing um, which is good. I like. I just participated in some suburban fishing over Father's Day weekend. In fact, but uh, what does it mean if more people come into the Great Lakes region? So there was a study a few years ago. Carolyn, what uh, tell us about this study um, that you have? That you found right. out about right. So basically, it was a study looking at um, the the influence of human population change and aquatic invasive species establishment on future recreational fishing activities to the Canadian portion of the Laurentian Great Lakes. That is the original title. Um, But they were more or less looking like if more people come to the Great Lakes region, say because the ocean coasts are, um, are kind of like people want to leave the ocean coast because they're not as habitable as like the Midwest or something like that. Um, what could that mean if they come and they actually start to, to fish here? And uh, the study was trying to suggest that at least on the Canadian side, um, that that could have as big an impact or, you know, a greater impact than a new invasive species being introduced. So I guess, um, Katie, do you want to give a shot at like what, this study sort of tried to encompass and like anything else that you can uh, like share about it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, This was a really cool study uh, published only a couple of years ago, back in 2021. And like Carolyn, you just, you know, said this was trying to get an idea of really teasing apart a lot of different factors that come into play when we talk about, you know, the, the art and joy of fishing. And that's really cool as an ecologist, you know, looking at it from more of the human side of things, this kind of coupled social, social ecological system. Um, And so they were trying to look at different scenarios uh, where population was increasing in the, you know, Ontario province, what that would mean for people taking, you know, fishing trips, whether those were on boats or on shore. 
um, what kinds of fish they were catching, you know, were they targeting things that are more warmer water or cool water like walleye compared to things like, you know, salmon or lake trout. So there were like a ton of different factors they were including in their models. Um, in addition to the introduction and establishment of some invasive carp. Uh, so they were like putting all these different variables in and trying to tease apart what would have the biggest impacts. And, you know, kind of the, the spoiler alert we already said is that the human population increases would have almost like bigger impacts than just the scenario where there were the establishment of the invasive carps. So long story short, kind of the take home message is that it's really important when we're thinking about, you know, how do we manage fisheries? You have to take kind of the human ecological, you know, ecological and uh, human side of things into consideration in these bigger, bigger pictures. So that's, it's definitely a plug for more social science research in the Great Lakes for sure. All right. Well, that perks my ears up as someone who <laughs> always could use more funding. But so I have a question about these models and, and how they work. And I know you didn't do all of this specific work, but, but uh, do we know that this is like, they talk about how all models are wrong, or, but some are useful. So, so should we think about like, um, or should we just think about these as inputs and potential scenarios? Or is this something that's going to happen? I guess. Uh, do you, do you know? Oh, Carolyn, Carolyn, is muted. Carolyn has a point. Yeah. Sorry, I was just saying we could throw it to Titus. <laughs> Question. Yeah. We'll throw it to Titus. Yeah, you know, I think it's a it's a really complex issue, and you know, I think the models are useful to to kind of guide discussions now. But um, you know, when you think about uh, how fish management works, you know, I think the man the models can help to just kind of guide future management decisions and actually start kind of brainstorming, like how do you change fisheries management uh, so that you can have more people, more fishing, but also maintain those fish and, you know, also opportunities to, you know, target different fish. It's like, you don't have to just fish for walleye. You don't have to just fish for bass. You know, maybe there are a lot of other great fish out there that people might be interested in trying out. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, this was just one study looking at a couple of different things, you know, invasive species and human population growth. And the authors even talk about, you know, they didn't include potential effects of climate change in their model, which is another, you know, very big stressor. So I, I agree with Titus. I think it's kind of more of a guideline, not necessarily saying a crystal ball saying this is what's going to happen in the future. I mean, and what's interesting is that angling, like in general, has just been declining for decades, too. So, you know, more people doesn't necessarily mean uh, more fishing or more anglers. And, you know, there's also kind of a statistic that people throw around that, like, you know, 90 percent of the fish are caught by 10 percent of the anglers. So, uh, you know, maybe it maybe it won't even change things as drastically um, as as their model inputs said. Okay, so I have a follow up question about species and climate change and things like that. So are there warm water fish that could establish in the Great Lakes to be a great fishery that people would be excited about? So like, I know if you say like, oh, the walleye might not, people are like, but I want to keep fishing for walleye. Is there a fish? Do either of you know of a species that like might be able to live happily in the Great Lakes and people would have fun catching it too. If the lakes were to get a lot warmer, for example. Yeah. And why is it bull sharks? <laughs> no, 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 no bull sharks. No, no, bu no bull sharks in Lake Michigan. <laughs> Go ahead, I, You know, I will obviously uh, let Titus do his input. I would say my thought based on some of this, the papers that have come out is there, you know, the potential increase of bass fishing because um, bass are generally more of a warm water species uh, and bass fishing is big business across the U.S. Um, but there are limits on the bass too. Bass can't, you know, tolerate any temperature. So Titus, I'll let, I'll let you jump in your crystal ball predictions. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, it is... 
you know, actually, if you go back to, you know, when, when uh, the state of Michigan was, you know, debating what, what species to stock in the 60s, and, you know, they, they went with coho salmon and then Chinook salmon, um, actually, striped bass was one of the, the earlier, you know, options that they looked at. And, I, you know, I think that uh, some of the, you know, temperature was maybe a limitation there. So that is a, a you know, a, a sport fish that gets large and people might like to catch. Um, and it is just, you know, maybe not new species, but maybe it's just a uh, shift in, you know, what species are, you know, doing well. And, and that might be, you know, a shift in more bass, uh, you know, where we have kind of a limitation now, but maybe with a, a future climate, um, it might uh, support more bass and so support more of that fishing. So, you know, that with climate change and fish, it's always like, you know, are they shifting? Are they moving within their range? Are they doing better or poor? So, yeah, could could go either way. Are there is there a striped bass fishery now? I've seen so I don't know. I've never really fished much in this area, but I was looking for places to go. My dad was in town, and so we're I'm from Louisiana. We would go fishing for sea trout and red drum, um, and and all sorts of stuff. And so we're looking for stuff to do, and we're going to go salmon fishing. But it was like fifty and like five foot seas on Lake Michigan, and my dad expressed um, a desire to not go salmon fishing in those conditions. And and so it, on some of the websites they were talking about hybrid bass anywhere. They call them wipers here. Um, which I assume is a striped bass, white bass. I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. But are there, is there a striped bass fishery at this point or is it, it not much? Not much. I mean, some of the wipers, which are, you're correct, white and, and striped bass, um, are stocked in like reservoirs um, around kind of the Great Lakes region, but it's not really, you know, a major fishery, at least in the grand scheme of the Great Lakes Basin. In other places across like the U.S. and more like Kansas, Midwest, Plains area. That's you're good when I was see, in Georgia. Yeah, and big down in the South too, but not so much right now in the Great Lakes. But as Titus said, that there's always the possibility that that could change with a change in climate, changing interests of, of angling populations. Yeah, I mean, like, and the, the idea that stocking new species to the region, I think, you know, the discussions they had in the 60s, it would be a very different discussion today if, if we were, you know, widespread non-native fish stocking would be an interesting discussion, to say the least. Yeah. And it wouldn't sure. just be one guy deciding to do it. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Okay, so... Um... Just as a reminder, this is Ask Dr. Fish, a show where our two Dr. Fishes answer your fish questions, science questions, and life questions. If you have a question for our doctors, put it into the chat right now where you're watching this, either on Facebook or YouTube. Um, or you can use the Twitter hashtag, hashtag AskDrFish, or you can email AskDrFish at gmail.com. Um, and we do like to answer questions live, so... Feel free to put them in there. Okay, we danced around this topic in the previous discussion, um, but let's talk about another invasive carp, invasive black carp. Now, hold on, um, hold on now. Before we talk about invasive carp in general, we have to show uh, one of the classic invasive carp videos. Tammy, if you could put that up, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> And so for those of you listening, missing the video, we'll link to it in the show notes, but it's uh, some dudes being towed behind a boat with weaponry, <laughs> a lot of homemade weaponry. I think that's a sword, that's a trident, uh, and they're trying to uh, uh, attack the jumping carp, which we cannot recommend. Oh, we got one. Uh, you, you did I, We cannot recommend you do this, but if you were to do it, we can recommend you sending us video and we will absolutely play it. Uh, anyway, what, what, so, could, what could go wrong here, Stuart? I don't, I don't nothing. see any problem with this. Oh, <laughs> slow motion with the sword. He whacked its head off. Oh my goodness. Anyway. And I also <laughs> really for the viewers too, that the two, uh, the two young men in this video attacking the carp oh. are, are totally like covered. They've got helmets, helmets. protective gear. So yeah. If you're going to do this, probably also, a little bit of liquid courage too. Although not that protective because one of them just did the, um, just did the, uh, the groin, uh, uh, situation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is fun to show people do it. However, we really, you really shouldn't do this for safety reasons, for animal cruelty reasons. Um, and for many other reasons. So of course don't send us a video. 
Right. Sure, it's, so, it's, it's called it's called a cod piece for a reason, and <laughs> they should be wearing uh, carp carp pieces for protection. Yeah. yeah. So um, so let's talk. Okay, so that is a crazy <laughs> video, and um, I have not seen that in a long time. Um, so those are silver carp in that video, correct? correct. Um, that they are the ones who do the jumping, but. And we've heard about silver carp, we've heard about big headed carp, we've heard about grass carp. What about black carp? Black carp, they're kind of the black sheep of the, when we talk about invasive carps. So black carps, first off, are not those jumpers. Uh, they're not gonna be the ones you see jumping and mass out of the rivers. Um, but they're part of this group that we refer to, you know, as invasive carps. Uh, you may have heard of them referred to in the past as Asian carps, um, but it's really these four species, as you said, the grass, big head, silver, and black. And the black, you know, despite being kind of the black sheep, like I said, they're, they were introduced around the same time as these other species, uh, mostly in like the 1960s, 1970s. Uh, they're really, really good at uh, eating mussels and snails. And they were brought over uh, from East Asia, where they're native, to some of the aquaculture ponds in the Southeast US to help control nuisance snail populations and like these uh, basically fish ponds. But, you know, there's always, always the but with invasive species. Uh, when the Mississippi River floods, as it tends to do, some of the black carp from these ponds escaped got into the Mississippi River, and now they are established and uh, kind of making their way up the Mississippi River. So, so go ahead, Stuart. Well, first of all, now they're showing more video of the carp. I know, jumping. now we're watching it's, more it's jumping carp. So these yeah. aren't the black carp, but it's actually legitimately terrifying. Oh, um, yes. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be in a boat and, and all of that starts happening around it. So I have a question. Thinking about this and thinking about how we have a constructed ecosystem essentially in the Great Lakes, right? At this point, um, we stock non-native species and whatever. But one of the big problems is invasive mussels. So if these eat snails, which grow, you know, which grow their own shells rather than trading them out, as we all know, but and they eat mussels and things like that, why why don't we just let them into the lake so they can eat the invasive mussels? Kind of a old lady who swallowed a fly situation. You're, oh, yeah. can, I, I just, can I jump in? Yeah. yeah jump so, in. so, I mean, on the surface, you know, that is kind of your initial thought. I think that, you know, it could be interesting and, and maybe it wouldn't be bad. But I think, you know, from a freshwater mussel perspective, uh, freshwater mussels, which are already stressed and, and fairly rare throughout the Great Lakes, a lot of them are threatened and endangered. Uh, they would probably end up being the first fish because they're actually bigger bites and, and tastier food. So, um, you know, it, it, maybe they could eat the, the invasive quagga mussels, but what if they also eat all the native uh, mussels as well, which would not be good. Yeah, and that's especially not good because a lot of our native mussels in both the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Basin are really in dire straits already. So like this would just be, you know, another stressor that they don't need right now. So how far up the Mississippi have they been found? So that's actually a really good question. Um, and it's tough because they're, they're actually shockingly hard to sample. Um, unlike the silver carp, which are just like, obviously, you know, they're there because they're jumping out of the water <laughs> in these masks. The black carp are a little bit more secretive. Um, and so they've actually had, uh, you know, They've had some trouble knowing exactly how far upstream they are. They, they've been found in Illinois, in the Illinois River. Um, but it's almost like, you know, they've had to, a, a lot of scientists have relied on commercial fishermen to help us understand, like, where they're catching them. Um, it's just, it's, for some reason, it's tough to catch these guys. Yeah, it, and it's also a challenge because although grass carp, you know, when you see a picture of an ideal black carp and an ideal grass carp, they look different. They can look very similar in the field um, and be fairly hard to, uh, you know, to tell apart. And you almost need to, you know, do a genetic test to confirm that you're looking at a black carp. So, you know, that's an, an additional complication. Are the genetics close enough or far enough apart, I guess, that you could use 
something like eDNA, environmental DNA. Uh, for those listening, I'm not an environmental DNA expert, but essentially you can look for little bits of DNA in the water um, that the fish or whatever might leave and kind of detect it after the fact. And there's questions about how accurate that is, um, but do you know if that's something they might be able to use here? I think it's a possibility. Um, you know, I think there's also, they're doing, a lot of folks are doing work to try and figure out how eDNA moves in ecosystems, which can be a challenge in some of these bigger flowing river systems because you don't know exactly where upstream necessarily that eDNA was coming from. So it's, I think it, it's going to require both, you know, some research into the technology of eDNA coupled with some of this more traditional sampling and, and having eyes on the ground in the, the form of these commercial fishermen. Or put like a bunch of like cameras along the bottom or something like that. <laughs> tons of tons of GoPros. Yeah, we need exactly. them on the buoys. We need them on the buoys. We, we need, need buoys. Cool. Need GoPros. Okay. So I have um, one more question because um, we've had some conversations over the past year about names. And even Katie, earlier you said, you know, you may have heard these referred to as Asian carps, but they're invasive carps. That's how we refer to them now. If you're in Illinois, there's a whole branding scheme um, called Kobe. Yeah. And so um, can we talk a little bit about um, like, why does invasive species terminology matter? Um, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Because, you know, when we're thinking about how we communicate about invasive species, we wanna make sure we're being as accurate as possible. And so the shift from, like I said earlier, Asian carp to invasive carps, and actually a lot of folks now are more just referring to each species individually. It just kind of in the, it's important in the, uh, in the vein of accuracy, because these species all have different life histories. The silver carp and big head carp eat a ton of plankton, so they're going to have different impacts than, say, like the grass carp, which eats aquatic vegetation, and the black carp, which eats mollusks. So they all have different life histories, and if we want to be accurate when we're talking about the potential impacts, we want to make sure that we're not sort of just kind of lumping them all together. Um, but when we think about, you know, in general, how we're referring to invasive species, we really want to make sure that we're using language that is not going to turn people off, um, whether that's some language around invasive species has historically been xenophobic or used kind of needlessly aggressive metaphors that refer to war. Um, and there's a lot of people, uh, you know, such as L. Lauer with Michigan Sea Grant, Sam Chen with Oregon Sea Grant. Who are really, you know, doing a lot of really cool work to better understand, like, what are the impacts of the way we talk about invasive species on getting people to understand the, you know, the impacts that these species might have, as well as how we prevent them. So I think there's a lot of work that's being done uh, because we want to make sure that we are including everybody in these conversations because invasive species are such a threat to aquatic ecosystems. Cool. And I've listened to some of the discussions and they were people were also saying that it's it's more helpful to call it by something that helps people identify it. Um, Definitely. So that that's also kind of a cool aspect. I think. Well, especially because they are different. Right. Thinking about the black carp versus the silver and the, and the big head or whatever. It's like uh, we can use more precision in our language. Right. And if you can do that without you know, and, and reduce the risk of saying something that is either offensive or challenging to someone it seemed like a pretty good call. Right. Yeah, I mean, again, we really are just trying to make sure that we're clear when we're communicating that we are making like making it accessible to everyone because we need all hands on deck when it comes to preventing and managing invasive species. Thanks for that. I mean, and if we throw in, you know, like, uh, I mean, common names are very, you know, they're not that set in stone. I mean, you look at a, a species like a bowfin and there's like, 20 different common names, you know, regional names, and, uh, you know, so we have these accepted names, and I think, yeah, being, being precise and, and not labeling species on their, their region of origin, um, you know, and thinking about, you know, kind of indigenous uh, views on invasive species, too, even the term invasive species, 
um, is is fairly negative. And you know, the, the those species are not here on their own. You know, we brought them here, so you know, maybe we need to uh, kind of think about them differently and give them a little more respect and still help them to not uh, not, not impact their ecosystems just too much. Interesting to compare that thought, which I think is a good one, to uh, us all cracking up two minutes ago at a video of people murdering carp. And <laughs> so <laughs> we're large. We can contain multitudes, uh, I think. That's excellent. Hey, this is Ask Dr. Fish, a show where our uh, two doctors fish answer your fish questions, life questions. Oh, and science questions. I suppose those too. Uh, if you have a question, put it in the chat now. We have a number of people listening on Facebook and, and YouTube, and go ahead and put it in there. Or if you can use the hashtag AskDrFish on Twitter. Uh, I got my hashtag symbol down. Send us an email. Probably won't get it today, but AskDrFish at gmail.com. Now it is our favorite uh, uh, question to ask. This is an evergreen topic, and that is uh, fish spawning. Uh, this can happen literally any time of year. Titus, what is spawning right now, and do you have video of it? Man, I wish I did, but, uh, you know, it is, it is early summer. Um, you know, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to say perch are probably done spawning now, but, but definitely if you're at your lake, you might see uh, those little round circles of rocks. And, hey, it is uh, sunfish spawning season. Uh, maybe a little bit on the end of it, but they, uh, they nest and the males guard the nests, uh, you know, because uh, that helps uh, their little babies survive. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, getting into the, you know, minnows, shiners, uh, uh, lots of little babies swimming around. So, um, with that, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, on our internal chat, people are worrying that Titus is going to drop his phone in the water. Uh, and so we're all very concerned about your phone, um, Titus, but, uh, for those of you listening, he's on a boat. Oh, oh. Oh, we're getting risky here. This is very exciting. He's teasing us. He's taunting us like a mascot with a t-shirt cannon. Um, <laughs> so thinking about the, the bluegill or whatever bedding up there, because this is a good time you can go catch them. Is, is that a problem to catch male bluegill that are guarding their nests? Is that, you know, uh, hashtag problematic or is it is it okay to do? Yeah, it, you know, it can definitely be a, a concern. Um, it's the same with like largemouth and smallmouth bass. I mean, it is, it's a whole lot easier to catch a fish that's guarding a nest because they're aggressive, because they are going to bite at or go after things that are in their nest. So, um, you know, it is, it can lead to overfishing and, you know, you're also targeting, you know, male fish or, you know, a single, uh, single type of fish uh, that is currently guarding nests. Uh, and once those fish are pulled away, even if you catch and release them, uh, that opens up those nests to uh, predators coming in. Things like round gobies might just pop right in there for a quick snack. Uh, and even if that, uh, that right back at fish you, is released and comes back to its nest. So yeah, it, it can be, um, it can be a problem. Fantastic. Is it fantastic? We don't know. But anyway, thank you for... <laughs> it's not fantastic at all. I was on autopilot. I was like, oh, okay. I'm already trying to figure out how to... So podcast professional, right? I'm already trying to figure out how to transition into the next topic, paying absolutely no attention to whatever Titus was just saying. Um, <laughs> because as we've established more on teaching about the Great Lakes than on this show, I can't actually do what I need to do and pay any attention whatsoever. So it turns out, yes, this is tremendous content. Super. Okay. So I'll just awkwardly transition to another topic. Perfect. So um, we, as collectively, but Titus in particular, talk a lot about eating fish. So there's an initiative in the Great Lakes um, to use whitefish, which is a very tasty fish in my personal opinion, um, but use the whole fish, 100% whitefish. So what can you all tell us about that initiative? Yeah, so I can kind of lay the, the, the framework for this. So this is called the 100% Whitefish Initiative that was kicked off by the Conference of Great Lakes Governors and Premiers. So it's binational. Um, and the idea kind of spawned from uh, something similar that was done with cod in Iceland, which is basically saying, you know, a lot of times when we catch these fish, they are primarily 
you like what we use is the filet, which is what people eat. Um, and then the rest of the fish, every basically everything else that's not that muscle filet becomes pet food, fertilizer, um, or it's just kind of tossed. So it's, it's not having a whole lot of value. So the idea behind uh, this original group in Iceland was to take whatever is left of cod after you get the fillets and really figure out uses for these different parts of the fish, basically using everything from the head to the tail. Um, and I was looking at some of the stuff they were coming up with, you know, it's the usual like, oh, you know, dried fish that can be used later on, et cetera. One thing that really got me was using uh, fish collagen, which is kind of like, you know, muscle cartilage, you know, basically just like protein um, that was being used in like a drink. Um, and someone said it was like, it tasted like LaCroix. And I wanna know what kind of LaCroix these people are drinking because I'm not, I'm not sure I've seen like hint of hint of cod LaCroix at my, my local grocery store, yep. but apparently that's a thing in Iceland. So I, I think that probably tastes better than actual LaCroix, but that's it may. You know, my, my preference of, of sparkling waters. Oh, okay. Well, that'll be a different podcast. We'll rank those one time. But uh, so that idea of using the whole thing from like the tongue to the spice, as it were, is, is really uh, a good or it's good in terms of um trying to be more efficient is that something that that we could do with like carp here i don't know so we've had the carp they're bony you can make a dip out of them or if you're our director thomas hook you can make you can call it a moose which just sounds disgusting um and and but are there other and and they're doing cat food and that sort of stuff is is that a movement you're seeing elsewhere or is that just something that's kind of uh, unique to that situation I throw in a little bit on the, the Iceland example. I mean, one of the reasons they like they have a value like thousands of dollars per fish, and part of that is because they were able to create a whole industry that has these like using a fish product to make these burn uh, bandages, which are you know very very important for burn victims, but also you know a lot of value to that. And you know, so that would be the question. Um, for us in the Great Lakes, like they are looking at, you know, whitefish, 100% whitefish, but also, you know, what are, what are the other species? And um, I, I have, you know, kind of seen their, their pitch and it was in a room with a bunch of commercial fishermen. And I, you know, I think the question that came up there was, you know, it, you could create this, but like, who's going to get the value out of this 100% thing? And, you know, it, it doesn't seem like the fishermen are going to make a lot of extra money on it. So, uh, you know, that is a concern. Uh, but, you know, I think using all pieces of fish and getting more value is, is a great thing. So let's, let's get creative and, and use more uh, whitefish leather uh, for our, I don't know, shoes? Is that something it's, we can do? And so are they focused on whitefish to start because it's a relatively big fish and is also pretty prevalent or... Um, and it's just one that people care about already? Are there other species that they're considering? I guess is where I'm going with that. Yeah, I mean, so they started as 100% whitefish because that is the Great Lakes number one kind of total, uh, you know, poundage and it's the top fish. So there's a lot of it out there, uh, but they've kind of shifted to 100% Great Lakes fish uh, just to expand more to other species. So, you know, I think there, there's interest in looking at other species too. That is super cool. And I definitely, I kind of want to try that drink you mentioned. I know, I do, too, I do too now at this point. Just just to say you've had it. Yeah. I mean, we we had poutine and ketchup chips. Uh, so we could probably have, you know, white fish. Fish collagen. LaCroix. I mean, we could. There's a, a counter offer, which is we could not. All right, we'll do another reset. Um, this is Ask Dr. Fish, a show where our two Dr. Fishes answer your fish questions, science questions, and life questions. If you're watching live, please feel free to ask a question uh, that is related to what we've been talking about or not related at all because we are comfortable. We have super professional Dr. Fishes, Dr. Fish, who are really comfortable pivoting. Um, 
So you can put the questions into the chat right now and we will see them. You can use the Twitter hashtag AskDrFish or you can email us at AskDrFish at gmail.com. And I believe our next question actually came from the hashtag AskDrFish. Stuart, do you want to introduce it? It did. It came from on Twitter, Shad from DC. And this was actually a question in haiku form. So bonus points for Shad. Uh, you can follow uh, them at uh, Shad from DC on Twitter. And so I will read the haiku, and then there'll be an embedded question. I would point out, Chad, you ended it with an exclamation point, not a question mark, but it's a question anyway. This is it. Parents named me Chad. If you were named after a fish, which would you choose? Exclamation point. Which would you choose? So if you could choose to be named after a fish, which fish would you choose? Or alternately, are there any cool things named after fish that you know of? Well, I'll go no, right thinking. ahead because I have an easy one because, you know, oh, I named me. myself catfish oh. at this point. So uh, just with like, a, you know, K instead of a C. So that one's pretty obvious. But You're I mean, there's, yeah, so I'm going catfish. Um, but I mean, there's so many. I was like thinking about all the things that I know that named after fish. And you have things like places, you know, Cape Cod. Uh, you have Cape a bunch Cod. of. I yeah. never thought about that. Yeah, huh. Cape Cod named after yeah. named after Atlantic Cod, yeah. Lake Fishkin, um, Lake Fishkin, Whitefish Bay, in, here in the Great Lakes. Uh, so lots of places, uh, lots of cars actually named after fish. You've got things like the Stingray, Barracuda, um, and you even got things like plants. There's a, a wildflower called the Trout Lily. So mm -hmm. I mean, we, we could go on and on about things named after fish, but. All right. Well, if I were going to be named after a fish while Titus adjusts his ear, um, this is actually easy because my parents were going back and forth between Stuart and uh, Humuhumu Nuku Nuku Apua, which is the state fish of Hawaii, the reef trigger fish. So uh, they chose Stuart the in the end. Yeah, it was, it was a toss up. Toss -up. Yeah. Oh, Titus is adjusting his video. He may or may not be, we might be losing Titus. This could be it. He's shaking his head. He's looking like he's filled with consternation. I, I can say I would not be named after a fish. I'll You'd just not be, be named after a fish? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. My, my headphones just stopped. They're connected. Oh, we can hear them now. Yeah, you're broadcasting so, live to the whole world with your technical difficulties. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what technology can do. Um, is, is my sound okay? Can I still talk? You're great, way? man. It yeah, actually is amazing did, yeah. what technology can do. You're on a boat, Titus. We should reiterate that you're on a boat in the middle of the Fox River, um, not named after a fish, named after a mammal. And uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to tell us if you could be named after a fish. Behind me, lots of vegetation. Oh. Excellent. So yeah, so my answer is what would I, I think Esox would be a good uh, a good name. That's the genus for uh, you know pike and, and muscalunge. But I have always advocated you know people having daughters. I think Persina, which is the genus of the log perch, uh, is is a great name. And hey, name someone after it. It's a great name. It's there it's a very pretty name. Yeah, Persina. Yeah, I'm just gonna be quiet. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so since we do not have any questions from the audience, and thank you, Shad, for uh, thank you, Shad, for sharing that um, question and uh, subsequent discussion. Um, so since we don't have any questions, I'm going to bring up PFAS and PFOAS and all of that. So these are in the news all the time. Um, this is a contaminant of emerging concern, which means it's been around for a long time, but people are starting to be worried about the potential health effects. There's a lot in the news about PFAS and PFOAs in fish. And I have um, published on June 15th, 2023, a story from Connecticut, um, where they have put up some warnings about um, eating fish in particular locations. And my understanding is that with PFAS and PFOAs, it's really like their contaminant load is really location-based more than like a particular species or things like that. Um, so this is the story that we have up right now from Connecticut, um, where they're talking about warnings from eating fish from 11 bodies of water. I'm wondering um, what you all know about 
eating PFAS, eating fish from other locations that may or may not be contaminated with PFAS or PFOS. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of jump in here. You know, there's still a lot we really don't know about. One, the impact of uh, PFOAs on kind of human health or PFAS, um, but also just like how PFAS move in the environment, how they get taken up by organisms such as fish and incorporated into different tissues. Um, but we do know, like you said, Carolyn, that a lot of it can be very specific location based. Um, for instance, there's often uh, kind of PFAS hotspots around places like airports or military training centers where they use these firefighting foams um, to because they, the firefighting foams contain PFAS. It's a way of sort of uh, extinguishing. Uh, so there's very much, uh, very much very local hotspots or where there's factories that have created things. Um, PFAS are also kind of common in anything that's sort of um, nonstick or kind of hydro, what we call hydrophobic. So things like Teflon, stuff like that. Um, and when that gets into the water, then it, you know, kind of acts as one of your normal contaminants that's like, okay, where does it get stored in the, the sediment? Does it get stored in uh, organisms, et cetera? So all that to say, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I think we're just starting to get a sense of the scale that and prevalence of PFAS in the environment, in organisms. Um, and, you know, even in places that are remote, we're finding fish that have PFAS. So it's really kind of like, you know, um, and I think we, we may have talked about this on a past episode, but when we're thinking about, you know, eating fish with contamination advisories, there's a lot of um, balancing risk between, you know, knowing like where your fish are coming from. Is this a place near a hot spot? What kind of, you know, potential life history might influence its contaminant uptake? Um, all that to say, it's, it's one of those, yeah, very complicated factor things. Yeah. So every time we talk about eating fish, there'll be a comment or two on the Facebook thing right. about how you, you know, and, and that's well taken, right? Oh, that, that, uh, sure. but, but one thing that's really challenging, especially with this P, the, these emerging um, forever chemicals, as they like to call them, uh, which is so long. But um, one of the one of the challenges with them is, is we're learning kind of one at a time like one species or one type of animal at a time. And, and so there's that paper that came out talking about how bad it is um, uh, in fish, but we don't know what about other sources of protein, right? Ranging from things right. like beef or, or, or chicken or whatever to even, I mean, heck if I know, uh, maybe maybe uh, all the soy that we love to eat, uh, you know, I, I, we just don't know. And so it's really yeah. hard to contextualize. Um, and I'm told we have a question. Uh, let's see, there we go. This is from Keith. A uh, wonderful name, Keith Den I'm Dengenis, I believe. How many species? Oh, this is going back to whitefish. All right. Um, so let's uh, put a button on PFAS, and then we can go back to uh, then we can go to uh, whitefish. I think. Um, so Titus, did you have something on PFAS, and then we'll we'll go back. Oh yeah, PFAS. Um, yeah, I was going to just say, you know, here I am in Green Bay. We've got a, a there's a rock bass consumption advisory on PFAS because uh, Wisconsin does. Uh, has been monitoring it and we you know there are specific PFAS uh, for uh, advisories for you know some of our Great Lakes waters but also inland waters as well and it, it is a, an emerging topic that you know the, the science isn't there yet I don't think on what are the impacts or we just don't know what they are but yeah it, it sounded like you know being cautious making good decisions eating healthy um, I think fish can have a place for that and um, yeah well, it's got to be healthier than what I ate yesterday for Father's Day. That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> excellent. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, Keith uh, Dengenis wants to know, how many species of whitefish are indigenous to Lake Ontario? That is a good question that I do not know. Titus is going to take that one because I do oh. not want to get into systematics of whitefish and ciscos. Yeah, I mean, you know, we could definitely say they're cisco and whitefish and they're both corrigonids. Um Bloater uh, was another corrigonid that is, you know, historically was there. It's not anymore. Um, so definitely those three. Um, and from the the 
uh, last Iagler meeting, there are at least, we haven't lost any of those deep water Cisco's. Uh, they have confirmed they all exist and they might actually be two more that they're going to add. So take that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's at least those three in Lake Ontario. Uh, I don't, you know, historically, if some of the other ones had been there, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. And so, so are they all um, are they all interbreeding or are there distinct populations? Yeah, Let's so they're you know it, it's more of an issue of like historical population decline for a lot of these. Um, some of them will or can hybrid hybridize potentially, um, but yeah, it, they they usually stay pretty distinct um, species wise and. You know, our kind of interesting Cisco whitefish situation in the Great Lakes is really uh, because of the, you know, the, the historical declines. There's been, you know, loss of some species in some of the lakes uh, because of, you know, pollution and overfishing and, and all these changes that happened in the, the 20th century. Um, and, and now, you know, we're more of a, a, a restoration uh, mindset for a lot of the lakes, like Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, Lake Ontario as well. Uh, I mean, talking about Cisco, uh, there's that that classic Lake Erie Cisco picture of you know there used to be the biggest fishery for Cisco in the world in Lake Erie, and now they basically don't have any. So uh, you know, it, it takes a long time for these things to recover and, and get back to where they're at. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Katie? No, I just, I my joke about not wanting to talk about uh, whitefish is because there are, it's almost, uh, I've heard them called kind of Darwin's finches of the Great Lakes. There was a lot of speciation <laughs> um, and a lot of debate about what particularly makes a distinct species of corrigonids, which is kind of, you know, our this group of whitefish uh, found in the Great Lakes. And so it, it's one of those subjects where scientists get very, uh, very animated about what makes a species a species. So I'm glad Titus took that one. So at some point we're going to have to get on a, um, like somebody who does morphology and someone who does genetics and just, just let them go at it. I right? came from that world. <laughs> I came from that, my master's degree. I, I, I worked on fish phylogenetics and uh, I'm reminded of Sayers law. Uh, in any dispute, the intensity of feeling is inversely proportional to the value of the issues at stake. That's all I have to say about that. Keith, the, uh, DeGenis also asked about blue pike. Is it officially, first of all, what is it? That's my question. Second of all, is it officially extinct in uh, Lake Ontario? So speaking of what is a species and what's not, uh, blue pike is actually now considered to be a subspecies or a color morph of walleye. So this is where we get into common names being a little bit confusing. Um, and so there's this idea that blue pike, which were just essentially look like walleye, but with a bluish silverish color, um, used to be pretty common in Lake Erie, uh, Lake Ontario. To my knowledge, I, I don't know if they're, well, they're not really considered extinct because it's a color morph of walleye, um, not like a, an entire species. But So like extinction would be the wrong term, even if they were gone? Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. I mean, if we're getting okay. into kind of the the technical, you know, terminology of it all. Okay. Interesting. So officially extinct would require them to officially exist as a species, I suppose. Okay. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's not really a species. It's, it's a That's one way to solve yeah. the extinction problem, right? It's <laughs> just to find everything is one, one species. Everything's Very one nice. species. One love. Carolyn, do you want to uh, tr transition us into the next? Uh, yeah, I was trying to find a cool picture of blue pike because I, don't know I mean walleye pike. are so cool themselves and yeah. yeah so all right so the first thing I want to say is that we did have a comment come in during the naming um that uh <laughs> my name is Amon Preet but I changed it to Amon Priel that's Perfect. lovely that's wonderful <laughs> that's Amon Priel thank you Amon um okay so now um if you've not joined us before, so um, we do do these every other month. Um, and toward the end, we have our Dr. Fish play a game. And then um, 
the winner gets to have a soapbox for, I forget how long, 60 seconds, 30 seconds? No, I can't no. remember. No. Um, but um, yeah, and so um, we're doing a slightly different game today. Um, and so, but I have to share my screen in order this to do it. This is very exciting. What's so going tell us to happen? The yeah, I'm, uh, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. Um, so you're going to see an image. It's pixelated. It's going to turn into, it's going to become depixelated. Um, or more um, more refined. Anyway, I'm going to get more go down refined. rasterizing and stuff like that. We don't need to talk about that right now. But rasterizing. the question is, like, basically you're racing. So um, there are three different GIFs that you're going to watch. Um, and whoever guesses first, two out of three wins. All right. So... And if you have first, comments on Carolyn's pronunciation of GIF, please put those in the chat as yes, well. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, oh, Titus, so, oh, he's getting serious. Sunglasses are off. He's squinting in on the phone. Oh, this is exciting. I, I, I don't need my polarized sunglasses for this. I'm, no. I'm ready. All right. Ready well. So one sec. Let me just get it so that it is starting up again. And all right. So this is what you're seeing. Tell me what it it's is. A it's a fish. Done. Here's my soapbox. I know what it is. I know I'm going to say is. Johnny Darter. Katie wins. Whoa. That one was a Johnny Darter. Oh, wait. Oh, hold on. Wait. We have a whole deal. No, 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 no. No, no you're not doing that, Stuart. This is my picture. All right. So, sorry, Curtis. <laughs> Katie's going to win this. No I'm going to. Exactly. This is. This is biased in, in my favor, so I am all, all right. for it. So, here, one second. <laughs> you are Johnny Darter. Smalls. Johnny Darter, lovely. All right. Okay, everybody ready for number two? Yeah, yes. we already have a guess of Northern Pike. So is that right? <laughs> no, it was Johnny Darter. Wah, it was wah, no, wah. the next one. He's already guessed for the next one, Carolyn. Titus is just trying to get a to jump on it. Yeah, because so. he can't actually. All right, that's all right. Roll it, roll it. Sorry. No, sorry. Here. I accidentally closed the thing. See, <laughs> this is what happens when I try to do something new, but y'all are going to love <laughs> this one. <laughs> okay. Tammy's like, man, I wish this that is I good. could. This is good radio right here. All right, here we go. And go ahead. Oh, oh, it's an orca. It's a dog. It's knocking over a boat. Oh, it a it's dog. Newton. It's Newton. It's Yay! Whoa. Whoa. Right. <laughs> what is Newton? What is that? Newton is uh, Ohio Sea Grants. They have a, a stone lab facility in Lake Erie, and Newton is the island dog. And he's they have the a dog? Yeah. Why don't best. we have a dog? Why don't we have a Sea Grant dog? Uh, uh, you need right. an right first. Time. You can get a dog. You need a dog. All right. So Katie, Katie that's true. First, first island, the dog. Katie already won, but we're doing this because we're doing it. it. So, right. Here okay. We go. Number three. Number the third th GIF. We'll be up in a giffy. All right. Number three. It's a hellbender. What now? <laughs> he I guessed third. I can't really see it. Yeah. It's not a sturgeon. Oh, it's some kind of okay. a salmonid. A trout? Say, is it a bro brook trout? Nope. No. Nope. Brown trout. Green. Nope. Brown trout. Purple trout? Nope. Well, to be fair, oh, I lake... only know the common name. Go ahead. Is it lake trout? Nope. No. Nope. Atlantic salmon. There you Steal go. Yay! 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 We're just going down the list. <laughs> <laughs> Like which salmon is so it, it, imagine it on my phone, it is smaller than a postage stamp. So. <laughs> oh. Still nicely done. Well, you still got it. Only 17 guesses in. Titus. Nicely so, done. So. Nicely so done. Edit it, edit it to sound like I was right the first time, and then <laughs> all right, Quinn. Yeah. And if you could do that, two versus right, Quinn, actually, what you should do is leave this whole little spiel in, and then uh, we will all hear how corrupt Titus is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there we go. So we had Johnny Darter, Newton, the best boy on uh, Stone Lab, and a, an Atlantic salmon were the three gift gifs, whatever you want to call them. So, Katie, you are the official winner, and you get your soapbox, and Stuart can do the timing for however long it is. All right.
30 seconds. We should we should have like a Jeopardy S theme song, but we don't. So 30 seconds beginning now. So it is summer in the Great Lakes, and I hope you are getting a chance to go out and enjoy everything the region has to offer. Uh, you know, while you're out there on your boat, paddleboard, canoe, kayak, you're fishing, uh, just make sure that, you know, if you're taking your, your stuff between different bodies of water that you clean, drain, and dry. Um, we don't want to potentially move any invasive species between between water bodies. And, you know, those guys can be little hitch hitchhikers. So it's just really important that as you're having fun, as you're enjoying this beautiful summer we've been having, uh, that we, we keep our streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, everything, uh, yeah, you know, free from any future invasive species uh, movement. So fantastic. Katie O'Reilly, Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist, Illinois, Indiana, Sea Grant, Twitter. Follow her on Twitter at ask, nope, not at ask anything. At Dr. <laughs> Don't ask Katie. me anything. <laughs> it's catfish with a K. Thanks for coming on, Katie. Joining us from a boat, Titus Seilheimer, Dr. Titus, Dr. Katie O'Reilly, too. From a boat, he's in the Fox River. Uh, Titus, anything fun coming up this month? Um, hey, I'm, I'm out here on Green Bay all week. Isn't that great? Uh, yes. That is great. <laughs> What are you actually doing on Green Bay? Uh, surveying fish and uh, looking at wild rice and associations nice. with coastal wetlands. It'll be fun. fan dub dub tastic Well, thank you so much, Titus. And let's acknowledge that we are recording this on Juneteenth. So happy Juneteenth, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, Ask Dr. Fish is brought to you by the fine people at Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant, Wisconsin Sea Grant, and Gobi Dog Media. The show is produced and hosted by Stuart Carlton, Carolyn Foley, Dr. Fish, Katie O'Reilly, Dr. Fish, Titus Seilheimer. Now you come in with the second paragraph, Carolyn, and then we have like a little TikTok thing. Except that I don't have it open anymore, Stuart. So All right. you go. <laughs> the live broadcast guru is Tammy Winsel, eh? And produced by our great pals at Great Lakes Now. Sorry, sorry. The podcast version of the show is edited by the awesome Quinn Rose. And we thank Quinn for everything. Thank you, Quinn. Drop out of graduate school. Uh, the podcast artwork is by Ethan Kosak. Go check out his portfolio, ethankosak.com. That's K-O-C-A-K. Uh, you should ask him his fish name. Probably one that farts. If you have questions for Dr. Fish, send an email to askdrfish at gmail.com. Use the Twitter hashtag, askdrfish, or call our hotline, our fish hotline. Nobody else has one of these. 765-496-4474, or if you care, I-I-S-G. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening. We'll see you live on YouTube, Facebook at 11 o'clock Eastern on the second Monday of every month. Every now and again, we'll be randomly live from some other place or at some other time, but that's the plan anyway. In between now and then, though, if you have fish questions, science questions, or life questions, just ask Dr. Fish. Ha 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 